Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Talking About Birds, a Cardinal podcast that, yep, has also been traded to the Toronto Blue Jays. My name is Nate Heininger, and I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Vince Samorka. Hi, everyone. And this week, we are going to talk about the trade deadline. We're going to check in on the other roster moves that were made around the deadline. We're going to talk about the NL Central and their approach to the trade deadline. And we're going to talk about the upcoming series against the Rockies and the series against the Well, Hambone, I am here down in Florida recording live Ooh. from the beach on a uh, pretty crappy internet signal. So hopefully we get through this and there's not too much of a lag causing awkward pauses in our already often awkward podcast. Um, but I, uh, I did something today that I thought you would be interested to hear about something that you might even be a little proud of me. Then I went and I played, (laughs) I doubt it. 18 holes of golf today. Oh my goodness. Really? (laughs) Yes. Yes, I did. It was, um, I went with my father, my brother and my brother-in-law and, uh, yeah, we went to a went to a place out here in in uh, outside of wow. Destin, Florida. Yeah, and um, you know, I went in. How'd you with, swing them, uh, Nate? <laughs> <laughs> I went in with pretty low expectations uh, for myself, yeah. and uh, I haven't played golf in I think twenty five years is my <laughs> rough estimate of since the last time I played golf. Uh, and you know so expectations were low and i have to say i uh i failed to meet those expectations <laughs> oh wow yeah <laughs> was there a lot of swinging and missing the ball a lot of people don't understand that it's act- even when the ball's just sitting there it's, um, it can be hard to hit the ball you know it wasn't i i didn't miss a lot although i did some don't get me wrong um i was yeah. more often just like way on top of it so i basically just hit like a ground ball you know 25 feet in front of me or i was way under it and to continue my baseball analogies here or or metaphors i was a lot of pop-ups a lot of pop-ups sky high um okay uh, i lost a lot of of golf balls for some reason i I thought you're gonna say i lost a lot of blood (laughs) we uh we played the highest you could get is uh double par okay and um i got double par on almost every hole except for and and some of those were natural (laughs) some of them some of them i literally like achieved double par some of them it was like i don't know probably 10 11 12 you know um yeah uh, but i did however i had one bogey and i actually won the hole like I did better than everyone else. Wow. So I did have one moment of triumph, uh, which was funny because it was the second hole. And I was like, all right, <laughs> hey, you know, maybe, uh, maybe. Golfing Jeezy. You know. Yeah. And then it just went downhill from there. But uh, I mean, it was fun. Wow. Like, you know, it's it's not, uh, I'm like, you know, I'm blind. So half the time I'm just like, where, not even half the time, pretty much 100% of the time it's me saying, where'd that go? Where do I, where did it yeah. land? Where's the, Where's the flag? Which way am I going? You know, but uh, I, you know, I can get into anything and it's it was beautiful. Out, sure. And, you know, it's nice to, uh, you know, be out in a nice area. According to them, the golf course was kind of mediocre and actually really hard for me, having never really done it before. I'm like, I don't know. This seems nice, you know, riding around in a golf cart. Uh, yeah. You know, hitting balls into water traps over and over and over. <laughs> That's golf, baby um do you have the bug uh there was one time where i had a like 10 foot putt for par 
that I missed by like, I, I mean, a quarter of an inch, you know, and and for that fleeting moment, I was like, all right, I'm addicted. Um, but yeah. at, other than that, uh, no, not really. I mean, I had a good time <laughs> yeah. and, and I would like go again and in, in the right setting or whatever, sure. but it is pretty challenging for me, basically not being able to follow the ball. So I need a lot of support. So it's hard to imagine myself, yeah. uh, getting into it and really excelling. I imagine I would just be probably always frustrated. And so, uh, I don't know. It, 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 That's golf, baby. Old, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is that something that golfers say a lot? That's golf, baby. You've said it several times now. Oh, oh, that's what, yeah. And when we're on the links, it's huh, all uh -huh. we say. <laughs> but hey, you know, I, I I was out there. I I did it. You know, I put myself out there. Never take an L, baby. I think I did pretty well. <laughs> um, and I thought you would I find like it interesting. Yeah. I like that your version of putting yourself out there is going golfing. <laughs> really went out on a limb. I risked you know, it all. You, sometimes you got to put it all on the line, baby. My dad, um, my dad rented clubs for me, and man, it was. I no, really put myself out there. <laughs> no, I used my sister-in-law's yeah. golf clubs. <laughs> so <laughs> oh, that's even better, actually. And now I have to buy that's her a set of adorable. golf balls because I because I lost like half. I of bet hers, you do. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Uh, so yeah, it was fun. Um, but during this Good. whole time, uh, this whole time I've been in Florida has been the trade deadline. And so it's been, uh, kind of difficult. Uh, this is a real problem, you know, real, a real life struggle which yeah. is how do I spend time on the beach while also checking, uh, all my social media, making sure I'm plugged in. Uh, and, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's been a real struggle for me. How, how have you fared? this last uh these last few days of this trade deadline well well i'm an excellent golfer uh thanks for asking so that that's been uh -huh. going well for me um i was yeah. uh i was getting i was very antsy the last couple of days um as i you know tend to get and that that feeling of reloading twitter and reloading mlb trade rumors is so miserable because yes it, you, it's just the one little tweet you know, it's the six words or whatever that you you're waiting for and they come across. Yep. And unfortunately, Twitter is still the best way to get that information. Um, but I actually went to go see Oppenheimer. I, I Barbenheimered uh, on Monday night to kind of nice. give myself a little bit of reprieve. I knew I couldn't pull out my phone for three hours. It felt longer than three hours. But um, so, yeah, I've, I've been dealing with it. And then I think, you know, when the dust settled. I was left kind of looking around waiting for more. And, and, and I think a little, a little disappointed, although I, I, I will talk about it. There's, there's good things, uh, for sure. Um, but yeah, I was, I guess to get back to what you were asking me originally, I was absolutely glued to my phone or the computer the entire time, um, in a, <laughs> a, a bit of a stress fit yeah. and, uh, and, and, you know, came out the other side. Okay. Yeah. I guess. Um, I have seen, did you see Barbie and Oppenheimer or have you only seen Oppenheimer so far? Yeah. I Barbenheimered. What do you, what, what do you think I mean when I say that? Okay. So you went, well, I don't know. I'm just checking. I've seen Barbie, but I haven't seen Oppenheimer yet. Um, I loved Barbie and I, yeah. I really want to see Oppenheimer. I'm, yeah. Uh, it, it seems great. So I don't know I if there have been two the world more opposite now movies, more but yeah, I enjoyed them both. Between yeah yeah uh we need more discourse around our barbie and oppenheimer but um so you kind of touched on it a little bit around your overall from the trade deadline uh and i kind of feel the same and we're going to talk about the specifics the individual trades here in a moment but i'd love for you to expand a little bit upon your your overall takeaway from the cardinals trade deadline yeah. Hey, hey, Nate, how about this real quick for you? It's trade and men. Hallelujah. It's <laughs> trade and men. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm in love. Yeah, it's good. Because, <laughs> you know, baseball trades were happening. I prepared yeah. that for the show. Yeah, and it's men. I could tell. He had a and little dance men. for it and everything. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So I, I, should I, I'll start super high level and then we'll get into the trades, I guess. Is that, does that make sense? Yeah. Let's do that. Okay. So my super high level thought on this and why I'm left a little disappointed is because John Mozalek did what he had to do. Um, he did not extend himself even one tiny little ounce, uh, but he did exactly what he had to do. And by that, I mean, he traded away the pieces that had value on the marketplace that were not signed or guaranteed a contract for 2024. And the reason I say he had to do that is because if he didn't do that, there might be a line of talking about bird listeners and hosts outside of Bush Stadium trying to bang and get into his office saying, what the hell are you doing sitting with Jordan Montgomery for another two and a half months with absolutely no shot at the playoffs? So it, he had to do that. It would have been incredibly stupid of him for him not to get rid of those guys. The reason uh, why I do think Cardinals fans should be happy is that I do think when you're when you put it in that context, 100 percent rental pieces were the uh, 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 the, 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 what were traded out of St. Louis, you got some serious talent. I, I think for the fact that you're essentially giving two months of control for each one of these guys. And obviously there's varying levels of success and needs for the teams that receive them, but you got real players back and you got real minor league depth back, which in itself is very impressive. I just would have thought with, with the way that the hitter market seemed to be going, um, the fact that Bellinger was taken off the off the trade block, that there were there were just it was hard to find hitters. The fact that Mo could not strike while that iron was hot was disappointing to me. Um, and I understand why he didn't do it. We could talk about that more, but it, it, that's the reason I was kind of sitting here saying, "Well, that's great." We still have a log jam on the uh, position player side, infield and outfield. That problem still exists. It makes it more difficult to to give those guys a runway for the final season or the final couple of months of the season to see what we have there. Um, but we're just going to be stuck with the same log jam. Tommy Edmund is healthy. It's even more of a log jam. And, you know, here we are. So so that's my that. Like I said, my 30,000 foot view on the trading deadline for the St. Louis Cardinals. Yeah, I, I'm pretty much 100% aligned. I was really, I think, along with everyone, was really looking for or really hoping for one of those big trades that was going to move at least one, if not more, outfielders, clear up who the playing time was going to go to for the last half of this year, and just see what we've got for 2024. As it stands, right, we really have no questions answered about what the 2024 roster is going to look like. And we really don't know what sort of playing time is going to be assigned. That'll help us define that. It's kind of the exact same. It's not kind of, it's literally right. the exact same situation since they pretty much just only traded pitchers. Now we did trade Paul DeYoung, which right. maybe moves, uh, you know, at least in the short term, Tommy Edmond into, sh into uh, short, we haven't talked about it yet, or we'll talk about it later, but Brendan Donovan is out of the picture now. So that's going to free up Gorman at second base. And so it really does become that log jam as purely the outfielders. But still, I would have loved to have seen uh, an attempt to address that now and really give some solid playing time to a few key outfielders for the second half of the year. Um, so right. I kind of feel the same as you. Um, I it, it puts the Cardinals in this spot where... I think depending on who you talk to, they have either two or three starting pitcher spots that they need to fill, fill next year. As we know, there's two levers you can pull. You can either throw money at somebody on the free agent market. There are decent starting pitcher names on the free agent market next year, or you can use prospect capital and go get somebody young and controlled. Um, and I just think it's, it, it I, it's not going to be impossible to do both of those things, but it has not been Mosaic's style yeah. of building this team over the past 12-ish plus years to go out and make two things like that happen. And I really believe, however you're acquiring these people, uh, these starting pitchers, whether it's on the free agent market or the trade market, and if it's two or three, one like one of those guys has to be close to a number one type starter and the other two have yeah. to be twos. These have to be higher end guys. Yeah, 100% agree. Um, 
So, you know, I, I think we, we got a little bit of reporting saying that the Cardinals are highly valuing all of their players, which isn't surprising. Um, you, you know, that's what you want. Um, so my guess is that there just wasn't the right package for Dylan Carlson or, or, um, a, or, a, or Burleson or something where the Cardinals will feel like they're getting full return on their dollar. And it, they likely have punted that to the off season. Cause I, I still believe that that is what ultimately is going to happen is that yeah. there's going to be a, a big trade from the outfield for somebody next year, whether it's a top of the line starter or somebody who fits in at that number three or that num- or number four, you know, who knows? Um, but I, I think they likely kick the can down the road on it, which we don't know those conversations. Like it's really hard to have a judgment on that decision without knowing what sorts of offers they were getting if they were getting legit offers and turning them down i'd you know question it but if they weren't really getting much like you and i are both big dylan carlson fans the last thing i wanted to see is them give dylan carlson to the o's for nothing right Right. like you'd rather hold it and and wait for real value so i it's really hard to render a, a judgment on that lack of move but it certainly yeah. it, it certainly just leaves a lot of things still unclear about what the last half of this year is going to look right. like and what 2024 is going to look like. Um, but yeah, and your... I think like there, you know, there's some reporting around like the, uh, Dylan Carlson to the Yankees and that move right there. Maybe the Yankees were, were actually really making a legitimate offer, but the Yankees don't have players that line up well with the Cardinals. I don't want, I think their best starting pitching prospect is uh, Will Warren, who is kind of, he's a a 24 year old kind of, I don't know, fourth starter with a little bit of a fastball. And other than that, they're mostly position player rich and that's not the kind of, so if if there's truth to that, then it it makes sense. It, but I'm still left disappointed at the trading deadline. Yeah. Agreed. Now what they did do, which you already mentioned and I'll echo your sentiment like what they got for the rental pieces, I think we should be really excited about. Three of the Cardinals now top 10 prospects have come from this trade uh, deadline. And uh, Tacoa Roby, or is it Robbie? I've I've been unable to consume any actual... Okay, I can only read... I've only been able to read names right now, so (laughs) I'm going to rely on you to tell me how to pronounce some of these names. But uh, Tacoa Roby is now on on several lists the number three prospect in the Cardinals system and and projects to be a very solid starting pitcher at the major leagues. Now, will it be 2024? Uh, that's hard to say, but you're still getting a potential starter for the big leagues for a two-month rental, you know? So yeah. really, really good return. But why don't, why don't we why don't we go down the list now and talk yeah. about some of these trades individually? And you want to, let's start with the, I think let's start with the big one. Let's start with Montgomery and Stratton to the Rangers. Yeah. 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 So as Nate just said, Jordan Montgomery and Chris Stratton go to Arlington. The Cardinals have received left-handed relief pitcher, John King, who made his Cardinals debut this week, as well as infield prospect, Thomas Sagasi and right-handed pitching prospect Tacoa Roby. Um, and I'll say, I think this is not only the biggest talent going out, obviously Jordan Montgomery, very solid. I, I think I saw somebody on fan graphs mention him as an overqualified number two. And I think that's a great way to describe him. Super solid pitcher. Um, and Chris Stratton, a little bit of a throw in, but I bet you that got you. Uh, m- maybe that's how they got Sagasi. Maybe, maybe that's how John King got thrown in there. Um, but like Nate was alluding to, yeah. Takoa Roby is really what this trade is about and is really... I mean, this is a top 100 guy. He was, I think he was in the top, uh, he was in the 60s range, depending on which, you know, list you're looking at. But the fact that you can get a legitimate impact prospect, a guy with swing and miss stuff, um, a guy who is maybe a little undersized, but has a fastball and two nasty breaking balls for two months of Jordan Montgomery is, it's, it's, it's amazing. It was really what it comes down yeah. to. And then also, you know, quickly looking at Sagasi, uh, Sagasi, Sagasi, I don't know. Sags. I don't know. Um, he looks Sags. like a guy who he looks like a Cardinals player. Sags. He looks like a Cardinals <laughs> player to me. He He's like almost like a right handed Brendan Donovan 
contact player, uh, no batting gloves, gritty, you know, gritty gutty white guy. Um, I think he'll very likely be with a big league club either later this year or next year. Just seems like one of those guys he'll come up, play okay defense, contact, that kind of thing. Um, not somebody who I think is gonna like move the needle, but somebody who is an excellent like 24th, 5th, 26th man on your roster that really fleshes the team out. So those two guys alone, I think a great return. Yeah. And every team needs guys like Sags. Uh, and you never know. <laughs> sometimes it can develop into a Brendan Donovan, right? Uh, and can end up being a even more impactful part of the team than you initially project. But but yeah, Roby is really the centerpiece of this. It's exactly what they needed to acquire and what they were capable of acquiring with that sort of trade capital. No team is trading a like a top, top pitching prospect, but Roby is is approaching that and could become uh, with some more time and hopefully some good Cardinal development, though, you yeah. know, we're both skeptical of that. He could become a, a, a pretty legit uh, pitcher and pitching prospect. So it's a good trade. Well, and I, I think we're all happy with it. And the good news there is that, you know, really, if the Cardinals could just sprinkle a little bit of their starting pitcher uh, velo increase on him, he could really take a, a step up. And, and really, I hope they don't yeah. do much else other than that. The guy, <laughs> you know, depending on what scouting report you're, you read, he already has four pitches that are major league ready. It's really just about yeah. consistency. There's not one pitch that really pops off the page. He sits around 92, 96. If the Cardinals can tick that up even slightly and he can hold on to those, the breaking balls and the changeup, I mean, this, he should be a frontline starter um, for the Cardinals, a, a solid two or three, um, which, you know, you're essentially getting for uh, <laughs> what, like eight weeks of Harrison Bader and a uh, year and a half of Jordan Montgomery turning into Roby. I mean, that's we give Mo a yeah. lot of crap, but this has been a very good series of trades uh, starting from last season to this year. Yeah. So uh, let's let's move down the line. Um, why don't we talk about uh, the Jack, uh, the Jordan Hicks trade? Let's do that one next. Yeah. Jordan Hicks, obviously from the Cardinals uh, to the Blue Jays in exchange for a couple of right-handers. Sim, Sim Roberset, um, who is a starting pitcher uh, from the Netherlands. Um, so Sim Roberset is, I believe, how you pronounce that. And Adam Klofenstein, much easier to say. Uh, both starting pitchers, uh, they're very funny in the sense that they're both right-handed starting pitchers. Sam is like 6'1", 185, and Adam Klofestein is like 6'6", 250 or something like that. Uh, so one big and one little. Yeah. Uh, Sam seems to be a little bit more cooked and a little more projected to be lower, like a, like a fourth or fifth guy in the rotation, control guy with a good breaking ball. And Klofestein is very interesting to me. He is not rated super highly on the prospects list, but is super duper toolsy. Um, and my guess is the Cardinals will either convert him to a relief pitcher and try to get him into the big leagues quickly, get that big fastball up there soon, or kind of hit the reset button on him and try to develop him into a starter. And, you know, my, my opinion on that is, I don't know. We'll, we'll see if that's a good idea or not, but um, be curious to see how they use these guys. And again, I think, you know, they're in our top 20, uh, the Cardinals top 20, as far as prospects, these are still impact players at some point and more arms and depth and, and all that crap that we need right now. Ben, you know, who was little and cooked today, uh, me on the golf course, it was hot. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, I think that the, that, that uh, sucked. uh, the the return for Hicks was pretty good, um, man. There's there's a lot of lag right now, so my, my joke and your response is making me feel real good because it was like five seconds <laughs> in between. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean it. You know, two. It's again, you have to put everything into perspective. Two months of a reliever, which is the most yeah. like extreme small sample size thing here. So like, no, like maybe 15 innings. Yeah. And Hicks was 
generally considered the best reliever on the market, I, at least the best reliever that was obviously being traded on the market. Um, we saw like Bednar got traded. You could argue he was better. You know, there Seawald was traded. You could argue some of these other guys were better, but Hicks was the most front and center. This guy's available. He's being traded. And um, I, you know, whether how they end up in the majors, I think, as you pointed out, is unclear but the fact that both of these guys will likely end up being major league pitchers i think is is quite a return and if either of them can stick yeah. it as a starter um it's it's just that more added depth that the cardinals absolutely needed all right how about the paul de young trade uh what yeah. do you think of this one yeah i mean you know this is fine um i don't think there was no way you were going to get much more than what you got with Paul DeYoung. Um, so you go out, you get Matt Swanson. Um, he is a younger guy who throws hard um, and is very likely on the reliever track uh, now for the Cardinals. And, uh, you know, it's this is a very underwhelming deal, but it, it's underwhelming on both sides, right? Yeah, Cardinals fans yeah. shouldn't really feel one way or the other about it. The Cardinals get another arm um, to dream about, to project on. Maybe he becomes something. Um, he's got decent strikeout numbers in high A right now, um, but it's it, this is a lottery. Yeah. You know, it, it's it, we could never talk about Matt Swanson again, um, or he could work his way up quickly through the minors, strike guys out, convert it to a closer or something like that, and maybe he's a piece. But uh, it, it's you know totally. 50 50 shot, maybe, maybe 60 40 shot, really. Yeah. Overall, I was happy with this return for all the reasons you stated. I mean, we, we have been highly critical of Paul DeYoung. Um, as a player, of course, I, I, it should be restated as we will probably not talk about Paul DeYoung as, uh, very much anymore for the rest of this podcast. That Paul DeYoung as a person is a really good dude. I think, I don't know if you saw the story going around that he spent like, what was essentially his last day in St. Louis volunteering at the Ronald McDonald house and, uh, you know, spending a lot of time with the community, something he absolutely right. did not have to do on he, on a day he was certain was going to be his last day in St. Louis. He chose to volunteer. So that's incredible. Um, but as a player, we've been kind of ready for him to move on for quite a while and for a lot of reasons. And so getting anything in return, I think is a win for the Cardinals and, I think Matt Swanson is pretty intriguing. Um, you know, the the pros for him is that if you look at those numbers in a vacuum, they look dynamite. He was crushing single A. Uh, he was 24 years old, which is very old for single A. So I think we're going to find out really quickly what we have in Matt Swanson because he has been assigned to double A, uh, which should be an actual test for him. That's where you really start to get into guys of that age range and that skill set. So I think we'll find out pretty quickly. And I suspect that he's got a yeah. shot to be in the majors by next year, or we just, you know, he's a farm hand and just a interesting piece yeah. of the, you know, Cardinal story around Paul DeYoung. Yeah. And I also like to the Paul DeYoung side of things, I do think getting out of St. Louis is probably good for him, even though he's put up a decent year. I think there's, there's local pressure. He's kind of a hometown kid. He's had the struggles. I, I think a reset button for Paul D is probably a good thing. And also like if anyone can help him with hitting issues, the blue Jays might be top of the list. They have a yeah. great hitting program. They're always churning out hitters. Maybe they can help him unclick something or, or get out of his own head a little bit. And I yeah. will, uh, I, I mean, you know, I'm going to be watching Blue Jays and Orioles games for the remainder of the year to watch our Cardinals. And because, you know, this show is called Talking About Birds. Yeah, I was thinking we need to formally adopt for this second half of this season uh, the Talking About Other Birds segment. Yeah. And just check in on the Blue Jays and the Orioles as they make their playoff runs. Um, they, they will be my, uh, they were already two of my favorite teams in the league. Yeah. And, and so, uh, you know, now that we're done, I will definitely be rooting for those two teams. I haven't decided if I'm even going to pick an NL team as my sort of favorite for this season. Um, but I, I don't know. We'll give it a little bit more time. All my favorite I, other teams are in the AL. 
Yeah, I'm going I'm O's uh, for the AL, and I'm going Padres. I think the Padres are going to flip the gear around. I think they're going to get their shit together. And with their huge, talented roster, I think they're going to they're going to drive really hard for the remainder of the season. Could be. That'd be fun. They've been trying for years now. So we'll see <laughs> yeah, they, they have. Together. So Cardinals made a lot of moves. There were a, a bunch of moves throughout the control, and we wanted to talk about that as well. But before we do, we want to remind our listeners that this show is listener-supported on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Talking About Birds. If you've enjoyed the show and want to support us, support the work and the time that goes into bringing it to you, I'm at my at a I'm in Florida right now recording this. Do you want to support that kind of commitment? Uh, consider joining our Patreon, patreoncom slash talking about birds. Uh, supporters at any level get access to our private Discord, which is a uh, a chat server um, that allows you to get out of the bubble of all of your various social medias, or maybe it's not a bubble. Maybe it's a frustrating place where there's a bunch of people uh, that are spouting a bunch of uh, stuff that makes you angry. Instead, come to our nice little space in the bird scored. Uh, we're having a great time in there chatting about baseball and, and, and a ton of other stuff. Our fantasy baseball season will be wrapping up pretty soon. Good luck to the, to the rest of the patrons that are that are competing in it except for uh beefy boys i hope they fail miserably um and yeah so patreon.com slash talking about birds if you want to support the show in another way consider leaving us a review on your favorite podcast platform it helps uh ben where can people find us online yeah make sure to follow us on twitter at talk about birds uh we're on instagram at talking about birds uh we got a tiktok Check us out on TikTok um, if you want to see our faces. And Nate's, uh, my God, sunburned, um, <laughs> scraggly hair. I mean, it's a real trip this time. I'll, I'll make sure to put up some yeah. great photos or some great videos on the TikTok. Check check us out on TikTok. Uh, we're on Spotify. If you prefer to listen to your podcast there, uh, you can email us questions, thoughts, concerns, uh, criticisms to talkaboutbirds at gmail.com. Um, and of course, you can find all of that information in one handy dandy spot called talking about birds.com. Talking about birds.com. Uh, well, Ben, I think it's safe to say the Cardinals were the most active team at the deadline, even though it was for a bummer reason. Uh, the NL Central, there were a bunch of individual moves, but like big picture. It's almost as if every team decided to stand pat. So I think yeah. with that said, like the I think the biggest story from it is that the uh, is that the Cubs decided to go for it rather than yeah. sell, which I guess I'm glad about because I don't think they have a shot at it. So I'm glad that they chose rather then acquire more talent for their uh for like cody yeah. bellinger they decided to hold um but well i i don't know what, what what's your take on it i i okay it's, it's complicated right because the cubs have done a pretty good job at trading for talent mid-season the past few years um they didn't do that they decided to push and i think i i see a lot of arguments either way i think it's actually pretty interesting why they decided but Anyways, if you look, they actually have the best team performance in the National League Central right now. They have a positive run differential. Uh, they have had some bad luck, but they've outscored their opponents more than any other team in the Central. And it's actually not that close. So I get it. I get under why they uh, are looking at their team and their record and they're being optimistic. And I think they're hoping that they can get hot and dominate the last couple of months of the season. And I don't think uh, if they were to leapfrog, um, at least the Brewers, uh, or sorry, the Brewers and Cincinnati here in the next month, that would not shock me. Um, would I bet on it? 
No, but what I think it really came down to is the Cubs are about to re-sign Cody Bellinger and they wanted to have exclusive rights to be able to do that in the offseason. They're going to back up the Brinks truck. They're going to try to build the team around Swanson and Cody Bellinger because he's fitting in so well. He's obviously enjoying Chicago. And I think that's really more what this is about is building the team for next year and taking a shot this year. Because, yeah, they didn't trade Belly, but they didn't really do much of anything. They kind of just sat pat. So I think that they'll, yeah. like I said, retain him, improve the team on the pitching side, specifically the relief pitching side. And I think it's it's not really a good thing or a bad thing for the Cardinals. Uh, I, I think Cardinals fans are, are will be sad when Belly gets re-signed at a, a nice Cubs friend uh, team friendly deal, and that's going to be disappointing. Um, yeah. But I really, I I actually do get where they're coming from. I don't know if I would make the same decision if I was Jed Hoyer. Um, but again, if you want to retain, if you really are believing Bell- what Belly's doing, it's the right move. Yeah. And he's still young. So it sure yeah. seems legit. Um, and, and if this helps them in re signing Bellinger, that's probably worth it because he certainly looks like he might be the centerpiece of whatever team he ends up on uh, once again. Uh, which is cool. I mean, you know, it, it was all fun and funny to see like the the Dodgers, uh, you know, one of their best players just sort of collapse since we all dislike the Dodgers, you know. But yeah. like, I like Cody Bellinger a lot and I'm glad to see him having more success again. And it sucks that it's with the Cubs, but it's it's just more fun with him being good. Um, I was surprised, though. I I do get it. And I should say, like, I always support teams going for it. Um, I love that the Angels are going for it too. And I think it's better for baseball in general that the Cubs are going for it. Like I always, I would rather every team that is on the bubble decide to go for it rather than sell. I just think it's a, it makes the sport more fun. It's just a better overall experience when you have more teams going for it than not. So I I was glad to hear it from just a high level baseball enjoyment. Um, But I am surprised because I don't know. I, I, the Cubs to me it, it typically haven't taken the approach of let's just try to get in the playoffs and see where it goes. Um, and so since they're doing that right. this year, like they stack pretty poorly against the other better teams in the, in the NL. So I think they don't have much of a shot, even if they make the playoffs. Um, but you know, who knows playoffs are a random championship generator. You get hot, the short series, you never know. Even making it to the NLCS or something like that would probably feel like a huge success for them. And so it might be worth it. Um, and you're probably right about the 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 more like emotional reason behind it and the tactile, tac, uh, tactical reason of being able to have that exclusive signing time with Bellinger. Um, I suspect, and right. this is not off of, this is off our current topic, but I suspect that might be kind of what the Angels are doing with Otani as well. Uh, by going for it, and they've made some meaningful moves. No, one hundred percent, one. But it, yeah, yeah it, it's it's I, it's mostly just to try to convince Otani to sign to stay with them on a, on a like still huge but reasonable deal, you know. Um, and I kind of hope I, it works. I, honestly, I, I don't even think it has anything to do with the. I don't think it has anything to do with the money. I think it's just like, just give us a chance. Don't exclude us from the negotiations. Yeah. Well, and Otani said, like, it sucks losing all the time or something like that. So I think they're, yeah. you know, <laughs> they're, uh, they, they, they're reading the writing on the wall and they're like, well, if we're ever going to re, if we're going to resign him, we have to make an effort at winning this year. Um, yeah. Whether it works or not, I don't know. But I, I hope it does. Again, I like it when teams go for it. Um, the Reds and the Brewers, the two top teams in the division, basically did nothing at all. Uh, Guess um, people here or for future, but uh, he's been having a good year. Baseball, Santana is he's been all over the place and has been, um, you know, good. And he he did as. Wouldn't call it any sort of dramatic improvement to their team. I think right now we're just going to see a, a dogfight between the Reds, the Brewers, 
and the Cubs with the teams that they came into the deadline with. And everyone is taking this sort of approach of, well, we'll just see what happens. And we're not going to sell out for this year because they all have a reasonable shot at the division. And they're all kind of both competing and rebuilding at the same time. And so they don't want to lose any rebuilding assets. And they probably none of them think they can beat the Braves. So everybody is just standing pat and waiting until next year or the off season to make any meaningful changes. Yeah, I just, I get it a little bit from the red standpoint in the sense that they're very young and they're better quicker than they thought. And that's probably messing up their plans and they don't want to blow it up. And I'm sure they want to be very thoughtful of how they deploy these, all these middle infielders that they have. And maybe Ellie de la Cruz moves to the outfield. And, you know, there's probably all these machinations that are happening. Right. Um, so I get it a little bit. I do think it's disappointing. I do think you should strike while the iron's hot. Although I probably wouldn't do it if I had the GM hat on there. What I do find completely confounding is the Brewers though. The Brewers have a couple of the best pitchers in baseball. They're not going to be around that much longer. Brandon Woodruff is getting healthy again. They have Corbin Burns. They have the great closer. If their window is not to win right now, then when is it? Because I think it's closing here in the next couple of years. Once those pitchers get shipped out, um, I do not think that Milwaukee is going to resign either of those guys, um, by which I mean uh, Woodruff and Burns. I think they're going to be priced out uh, of the NL Central completely, and they'll be on a, a coast somewhere, maybe a Dodgers or a Yankees uniform. Um, but again, if they're not trying to win this year, or if they're not trying to make a deep playoff push right now, then what are they doing? Yeah, that was my thought too. I, I guarantee you that at some point in their discussions, so one of one of the executives at the Brewers said, "Well, we're about to get Woodruff back." And that's like a trade, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, which I'm sure if you're a Brewers fan, you have to be going insane. Um, but they're also, you know, they've got some good prospects coming up. Like they're in a, they're a, they're a weird sort of in between team as well. You know, some of their pitching is aging, but they've got a lot of good young offensive prospects coming up they might feel like you know even though they've got a shot at the division this year this isn't the right year for them to compete like fully go all in um but yeah i I was really surprised that nobody other than the well i was gonna say nobody went for it other than the cubs but all the cubs did is basically not sell (laughs) they didn't really do a ton to add so um you know the the division like the Cardinals have gotten worse considerably. So everyone else has stayed basically the same. The pirates traded a few people, like, you know, but like th- there's not much, there's been almost no change to the NL central. The, the brewers, you know, they, they got Mark Canha, which I think is probably, but they could have also got like Tommy Pham. They could have got Josh bell. They could have improved their offense in a meaningful way. And I think Mark Canha is a fine player, um, but he is not a guy that moves the needle for any team. Um, yeah, you know, ever. So yeah, it's just, um, not what I expected, but all, you know, I guess whatever, sit there and and sit on your hands and hopefully the Cardinals can catch up and we'll see. Yeah. I guess we're glad, right. That they didn't, nobody went out and acquired some big talent piece. That's good. That's going to stick with them for a couple of years and, and really move them to the next level. Um, you know, I, I think the off season is going to tell a lot about it, but I suspect that, uh, going into 2024, the uh, like it, it'll be a wide open race. I bet you'll see writers and 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 whatnot and and betting rooms and whatnot having a pretty wide range of outcomes with the NL Central, unless somebody yeah. does something massive this off season, which maybe the Cubs will. The Cubs, you know, they've got huge pockets. If they go out and sign an Aaron Nola and a Giolito or and a Sonny Gray or something like that. Um, Urias. You know, Urias. I think Kershaw will retire a Dodger, but he's technically going to be a free agent this year. Like, there's a lot of potential value out there. So, but I think you could say the same for the Cardinals. If the Cardinals do that same thing, they could be a favorite for the NL Central too. Yeah. So, um, yeah, well, I we, still we, believe that the Cardinals have like the highest in talent 
um, with Goldie and Arenado and yeah. and Walker and Gorman creeping up those lists and w- even Wilson Contreras. Like the high end talent is there. It's just not balanced at all. Yeah. The the closest I think you have to the high end talent of Arenado and Goldie is uh, Corbin Burns and Brandon Woodruff on the yeah. Brewers. And then the Reds with their slew of young prospects that look amazing, but are still, um, you know, un, untested. Like Ellie de, de la Cruz obviously looks like one of the most fun players in baseball, but he also struck out at like a 50% rate for like two weeks. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we don't really know what he's going to be. We know he's exciting, but is he going to be also elite at the same time? Um, you know, probably he sure looks awesome, but that's still out. Uh, and then yeah, Cubs yeah. with are, Bellinger, are, and you know. are the Reds going to become the Orioles and all their you know they're going to have like a ninety percent hit rate on their prospects, or is it going to be more like the Phillies rebuild and yeah they'll kind of sit around and have to spend money and yeah I don't know I, I I agree I think it's even with Matt McLean who's had a solid season um and has you know three hundred something plate appearances it's still a question mark for me how do these yeah. guys perform next year and can Hunter Green stay healthy. Uh, like the reds are a big question mark for me. Yeah. I do think that Spencer steer is probably legit and is going to be a good MLB hitter for quite a while. Um, he's the one that to me looks like the most likely, uh, like Ellie de la Cruz looks like the, the one who will has the potential to be a like MVP, you know, legendary level player. But I suspect Spencer Steer is going to be in the MLB for like 15 years. You know, yeah. like he's he's got steady play. Eddie. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, all right. Well, we do have some some, you know, we're, it's still, still a season. The Cardinals might be out of the playoffs, but that doesn't mean baseball can't still be fun. We still have a lot to look for. Um, so we've got a couple series coming up that we want to just touch on. Ben, this one's near and dear to you. We got the Rockies coming to town. Uh, what are we seeing of uh, from this what's, post? What's left of the Rockies? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, what are we seeing from this uh, post trade deadline Rockies team? I, I mean, they're an absolute shell of what they used to be. It was so Mary's two favorite players are Randall Grichik and CJ Crone, and they got traded away <laughs> in the exact same deal, of just course. crushing. She she's cursed. Everyone she, she picks really as her is. favorite players gets gets traded. I, I think we're on to Ryan Mack now. Ryan McMahon is our is our favorite Rocky in this household. Yeah. So we'll see how long he sticks around. But yeah, yeah. I mean, the Rockies are really bad. They have been bad all year. They depleted their position player talent. They depleted their bullpen. And there's nothing to deplete on their starting pitching because it just is non-existent. Um, I will say, I, I can't remember if this was true or not the last time the Cardinals and the Rockies matched up, but Nolan Jones is something to uh, to watch. He's yeah. been a very exciting player for the Rockies. He, uh, he's he got a rocket arm out in the outfield, and uh, he, hits, he hits the ball, the ball over the wall uh, quite a bit. So, so he's somebody to be excited about if you're a Rockies fan. And like I said, Ry Mack, is a, he's a pretty solid player and a great defender. Um, and that's really it. Uh, yeah. Elias Diaz, he, his, as soon as the all-star game was over, he's kind of been in a pretty bad slump. <laughs> um, jerks and Profar is turning out to be one of the worst signings, uh, the Rockies have made what? in a while, which is what? saying something. Yeah. No way. No way. Uh, Charlie Blackman's still out. Chris Bryant's still out. Um, yeah, man, the team's in a rough spot. <laughs> I'll say is equal Tovar. Uh, he's been hitting a little bit recently. Yeah. Um, and he is a great defender so that he's been fun to watch. You know, obviously I go to a lot of these Rockies games, but, uh, right. man, the team sucks. It's, <laughs> they are so bad. We are, we're in a, a dead race with them. The nationals, the pirates, uh, who's going to end up, you know, it, it is a lottery system now. So it doesn't just mean worst record in, in baseball gets you the first pick, but, the Cardinals are are racing with these teams to see who can end up uh, with the best shot at the first overall draft pick. Uh, they which, sure are. Yeah. Uh, so it's like we're in a we're in a weird mode now where we don't really want the Cardinals to win games, even though that is more fun and we are active fans who want to have fun. But like big picture, we don't want them to win too many. So this series against the Rockies, they should win. They should do better. But yeah, who knows? That they, I mean, here we are. You know. Uh, we're in, we're an un 
untested waters here as Cardinal fans. Uh, so we'll see how this series yeah, goes. I, I just say, you know, like go grab your favorite adult beverage or, or six and, you know, just watch baseball a little bit differently uh, yeah. uh, as, as the season wind down. I, I figured we'd have plenty to talk about with this episode for this trade deadline, but I was thinking like maybe for next week we could do something around like how, like what to look for and still enjoy in the next two months of baseball oh, yeah. and the Cardinals, you know, because there's still a lot to look for. There's still a lot to enjoy. Um, but even if the, even if the, the, the final score might not be what you, we are used <laughs> to seeing. Yeah. And we're, we're officially on Mason wind watch. Uh, so that's, that's yep. going to be exciting. I think that's going to happen here pretty soon. Yeah. We, we haven't talked about that. A uh, quick note or sidebar on that. I, I expect uh, and Derek Gould, I believe, said the same thing, basically, is that uh, the Cardinals don't want Mason Wynn to lose rookie status this year. So he will likely be a classic either late August or September call up. Uh, and and that's a bummer. Yeah. I'd rather see him right now. But, you know, the all the rules and and possibilities around rookie eligibility and whatnot, like it is what it is. And I, I think, you know, what's another three weeks in the minors, even well, though my my preference would be right now. Yeah. It is funny that the new yep. rule changes, it's kind of it's incentivized the player to actually want to stay down so that he has a chance to win rookie of the year, um, which it's it's the same problem that we had before the CBA. It's just. Uh, ran it's by different. a different motivation. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it they is really overthought so, that. But uh, here it is. Well, it is solved. Teams are more willing to call up their players out of spring training now, uh, which right. is good. Uh, but I do think it is delayed mid season call ups. So I don't know. One hand, you know, you have pros and cons on both sides. I guess like the the like April holding was way more egregious and way more obvious than a team in July waiting until late August or, or whatever. So it's probably an improvement and at least the players get some benefits from like winning rookie of the year and whatnot. Um, I, I don't know. It's a, it's such a complicated issue. I don't pretend yeah. to really be yeah. like an expert on the solution. Um, I do think it's better now, but it's not solved. Right. Um, so, so the, the other series kind of the opposite, uh, the rays are coming <laughs> to town, which yeah. should be fun. Yeah. It's a real baseball team. Yeah, though they are, uh, you know, they, they, if you remember how the season started, they were unstoppable. Uh, and right. Not to say they aren't still fantastic. Uh, I would not ever state that but they have not been the like juggernaut that they were for the first two months of the season yeah they, they are uh slumping a little bit uh in and around the all-star break um but i think they're they're coming out of it they have glass now who's back and healthy looks like zach eflin popped right back and, and is healthy brandon lau is uh is healthy and hitting bombs every day at this point i mean this team is just so stacked Wander Franco is still only 22 years old and is having another like light MVP type season. Uh, Isak Paredes and Jose Siri have both broken out with some serious power this year. I never thought in my wildest dreams, Jose Siri would be hitting 20 home runs in a season. Um, yeah. Not to mention playing some of the best defense in center field in baseball. Um, Yandy Diaz having a breakout season at the age of 31. We all saw that coming. He finally decided to, to lift the ball, um, and, and, and get some loft underneath, uh, Shane McClanahan is pitching well, and they might have my favorite bullpen in baseball as far as like just velo. They just throw so yeah. much gas at you. They have so many Straight strikeouts, gas. so many different angles. Uh, Pete Fairbanks is he looks fake the way he throws the ball. They're they're closer. Um, though, like he short arms 101 miles an hour. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're great. Um, yeah. So should be a t- this will be a good one for stacking uh, 
stacking numbers in that loss column as we <laughs> as we go for that better draft pick. Um, so let's oh, go yeah. ahead I think, uh, and uh, you'll test the kids. Test the kids against a real baseball team. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go ahead and talk about some news from around the league. Uh, ben, what have you got for us today? All right. Um, let's talk. We, we've talked a lot about trades. I'll talk. I'm just going to hit on the big trades, or at least what I identified as the big trades that happened this off se- or this uh, trading deadline. The two, I think, massive ones that happened, the Mets, the Mets, the Mets, man, uh, the Mets are Mets. Yeah. I guess it's easy to sit here and say now, oh, we probably should have seen this coming uh, when you're, you know, essentially attaching to 40 year old pitchers to uh, the success of your franchise. Um, but still kind of shocked to see how it turned out. Max Scherzer has been traded to the Rangers uh, for some nice prospects. The Mets are basically covering all of the money there. Um, and almost the same story. Justin Verlander goes back to the Astros. Um, these Both of these trades massively impactful. And I will say, if you're a baseball fan and you're like, I'm not super interested in watching the Cardinals going forward because they're bad, just go down to the AL West and let's pay attention to the Rangers Astros duking it out with JV and Max yeah. Scherzer frontlining their rotations for the remainder of the season. That is going to be extremely fun to watch. I really hope we can time it up so that they are matching up against each other. That is must watch TV. Um, but again, the Mets kind of breaking the, the the whole team down and sending those players off and, and receiving some pretty serious prospect capital. So uh, crazy moves. Nothing I would have guessed at the beginning of the season, but yeah, here we are. Yeah, it's another example of the Mets being able to to f- uh, flex in insane um, budget because uh, I mean they got some legit prospects. It's like four or five top one hundred prospects uh, f- from this, and it's basically because they fronted all the money on both of these contracts. Right. Uh, so it's another way that they're able to use a ton of money to acquire good players, even if it's slightly different than how we're used to it. Uh, so, yeah, it's pretty wild. I saw an interesting headline that or uh, article that was basically saying, like, Max Scherzer is such a strange thing where he is part of the reason why the Mets were so bad this year, having such an ineffective season. But he also is now the centerpiece of a massive trade. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And it's just like. You know, it's just his his name and and his track record, and you know, uh, on what was available. But it is pretty surprising for for you know you to for basically that to happen for you to be the big yeah. acquisition that fails, and then you are traded immediately. Yeah, and and then from the Rangers standpoint, the Rangers are so funny to me because they just keep betting on older, injury ridden uh, pitchers. And I think that if you would have told me that the Rangers would have been in the spot that they're in today, I would have had to say, oh, my gosh, Jacob deGrom is having a dominant season. Andrew Heaney, Nathan, all these guys who are always hurt must be killing it. And then you actually look and it's like, well, Jacob deGrom hasn't pitched in months. Andrew Heaney and everybody's been okay. Nathan Eovaldi has been the stalwart of the rotation but they have the best or the second best, one of the best offenses in baseball. And they're actually yeah. just bludgeoning everyone. The, the Rangers have had such a fascinating year. Um, and yeah, you know, keep rolling the dice. Let's get Max Scherzer for two years. Maybe him and uh, DeGrom will pitch together next year and see what happens. Yeah, might as well. I mean, it's working. Like they are, they are taking the approach of like, when we get great starting pitching, it really means we're going to win. But if we don't get great starting pitching, we've got all the tools elsewhere to still have a good season. Uh, and it's working for them yeah. really well. Yeah. Uh, moving down the line, I, I think this is going to be a low key big move. The Phillies acquire Michael Lorenzen from the Tigers. Michael Lorenzen having actually a really nice year uh, on, a, on a pretty bad team. The Phillies need help. Um, and this is one of those guys who I think can, um, he's not going to change your rotation. 
but he is absolutely filling a hole that the Phillies have. And the Phillies are, are playing well. Bryce is coming along They're They're, I mean, they're probably the main reason the Mets kicked the bucket, you know, um, is because of yeah. the Phillies success this year. So be curious to see how that does. But again, again, they, they kind of, uh, bolster their, uh, rotation. Yeah. I mean, the Phillies were, came out of nowhere last year to make such a deep run and, and they have essentially the same team and they've made some improvements. So if they can get in that wild card spot, uh, you never know, you know, and, and th- like their team makes a lot more sense to me for the, you never know approach than like the Cubs do to me. Like the Phillies yeah. have that high end talent. They have Wheeler and Nola and now Lorenz and like we, well, it's, it, basically we saw it exactly last year, you know, why they feel like they have the recipe for a deep playoff run. And, and there's no reason to think, they don't have that right now too. Uh, so we'll see. Yeah. All right. Uh, moving down to the diamondbacks, the diamondbacks make a couple of interesting moves. They pry Paul Seawald from the Seattle Mariners, who I think is a fantastic closer. Um, yes. and I think that's probably a great move. And they also add Tommy Pham to their outfield. I mean, I love what the diamondbacks are doing. It like, they're a fun team, you know, and they didn't like this was the right type of buying for them. I think, you know, like they're adding meaningful pieces. Seawald is a legit ad and Tommy Pham should give them some good um, umph in the outfield. Um, but they're a young team that's growing as well. Like this is what I would yeah. have loved to have seen if I was a Reds fan. This is what I would have loved to have seen like the Reds do. You know, not saying break the bank and go for it, but do something to add like a like add real talent to this team in this trade deadline. And they've been struggling with their uh, bullpen all year and they go and get one of the better consistent bullpen arms out there. And then Tommy Pham's revenge tour, you know, it just (laughs) keeps rolling. Uh, And he's been having a pretty sneaky, really good year for the Mets. So he should be good for the for the the D-backs. Yeah. And and speaking of that, you know, the uh, Giants were out there looking for a right handed bat and they were quoted in saying that they wouldn't even consider uh, signing Tommy Pham. If you remember, (laughs) Jack Peterson is still on the Giants and apparently it was a complete non-starter, which means that to me, that Tommy Pham has never apologized, that the beef is real. Um, I think it's hilarious. It's one of the funniest stories that's happened in baseball in years and it just continues. We get little 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 tidbits of the long-term ramifications of that story like we got from this uh and it turns out don't slap someone in the face uh when you're you know in a professional situation <laughs> no it's not funny is it is it funny it's kind of funny has there ever been a a, a public slapping that has gone well for the slapper because <laughs> it's no. there's we've got multiple now that we can re- we can make reference to no, not that I can think of. I, I do feel, um, no, they were equally unprovoked, weren't they? It was just kind of a, a lunatic yeah. acting, uh, acting wildly. Yeah. 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 It was actually in both situations. It was somebody making what they thought was a lighthearted joke and then getting <laughs> slapped for real. Yeah. <laughs> Don't make jokes. Don't make jokes. You just can't um, make jokes. All right. Yeah. The last trade I want to talk about, I already hit on it, but the uh, the Angels pushing in. They are um, they are just adding little pieces here and there, making their team one or two percent better. Gritchick and CJ Cron were the most recent ones. Um, I don't have the list in front of me, but they've made quite a few changes. They are doing absolutely everything to make their team better in the near term. Eduardo, Eduardo Escobar, Mike Moustakis, uh, they were trade for uh, earlier in the year. Uh, With Taylor Ward, I don't know if you saw it, Nate, while you've been on vacation, but Taylor Ward took a fastball to the face um, and is dealing with facial fractures, which is why they made more moves. Um, I think I saw that the Angels have 17 players on the IL right now, uh, which, if you're wondering, definitely leads baseball. Um, But I'll give credit to Perry Manassi, and he is not giving up. Um, I believe it is not because he thinks that they can push far into the uh, into the playoffs, but it's it's all about Shohei Otani and showing that he will do what it takes and that staying with the Angels means he's staying with a franchise that wants to win. And uh, 
just to add a little more color to that, I, I'm very, very curious to see what Shohei is going to do. I think that what the Mets have done has essentially taken the Mets out of the Shohei Otani experience because they uh, basically came out and said they are resetting the franchise and focusing on 2026. Um, and Shohei wants to win now. And there's not many other teams that can afford Shohei. I thought Mets would probably yeah. be top one or two. Um, so I'd be very curious. And and I wouldn't be shocked if he stays with the Angels. Um, maybe surprised, I, but not shocked. I do think this helps. And they have Mike Trout coming back soon. Um, he seems to be recovering well from his hand surgery, which is cool. We want that if you're a baseball fan. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I still think it's going to be the Dodgers. Um, I, it just, it, it makes too yeah. much sense. Um, but I do think that the, this trade deadline, the, the like pendulum or the odds, uh, towards the angels has increased considerably from where it was, um, yeah. even just two weeks ago. I agree for the, for exactly one, one major competitor going out with the Mets and the and the angels actually doing something to try to improve. And if the angels actually do make a run at it and make the playoffs and have even some degree of success, you could see Otani saying like this is where I made my commitment before and I want to stick it through and they're going to also pay me 500 million dollars. So, <laughs> yeah, right. you know, I'm going to stay where I'm comfortable. Uh We'll see. I think I, we've got we've got plenty of episodes this offseason to talk about. Show. Yeah, we do. Can, can I put my tinfoil hat on just for a minute? I'm curious. I've been thinking please. about this and just please check me if I'm if I'm insane or not. But do you remember how baseball got tired of Barry Bonds and he had a great year with the Giants and then became a free agent and nobody signed him and yeah. everybody was saying collusion, collusion, collusion. What's going on here? I yes. wonder if there is going to be some flavor around that with Shohei Otani and free agency, meaning that there's only so much money that he's going to receive. Like there are yeah. people projecting, you know, north of $500 million. And I wouldn't wonder if, or I guess I would not be surprised if there's some weird backroom ownership agreement that nobody's going above X number of dollars and Shohei gets multiple offers around the same quote unquote cap. Um, and, and if something yeah. kind of fishy happens, what, what do you think about that? That would not surprise me at all. Okay. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> yeah. The owners don't want that for the immediate cost and for the long-term ramifications it has on budgets and salaries and baseball. Um, he's an albatross though. And so right. there could, you know, there could be some version of like, well, Okay, yeah, Shohei got five hundred million, but you're not Shohei, and there will never be another Shohei. You right. Know? So it's not exactly the same, but it wouldn't surprise me at all uh, if that happened. I don't think that's likely to be clear, but like, if you're asking if I think it's possible, like, yeah, okay. absolutely. All right, I just needed to get that. Out. I'm, I'm saying it now. Yeah. We'll see what happens. It, it's against the rules of their own sport, but right. they don't care about that. We've no. seen it over and over and over. So, and what are they? Are they going to investigate themselves? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So, okay. We'll, we'll see. Um, well, let's go ahead and wrap up this episode. Uh, I got a little game for you. Um, after the trade of uh, Jordan Hicks and Jack Flaherty, two of the most tenured Cardinals on the roster, started thinking who still has. Who is now the most tenure, has the okay. most tenure as a Cardinal? Oh, no. So we're going to talk about that in another edition of Who Charted. Who Charted? Who Charted? So, Ben, I have the list in front yeah. of you. Top five Cardinals by tenure. Okay. Uh, number, number one's easy. Yeah. Adam Wainwright. Number one with a bullet, <laughs> Adam Wainwright. And then it gets really complicated. <laughs> it does. And that's why I wanted to play this game, because I think I would have struggled at this as well. OK, Paul DeYoung is gone. Um, Wilson Contreras has only been here for one minute. I mean, Paul Goldschmidt might weirdly be higher up than I think. Uh, same for Tommy Edmond. Holy crap. 
Um, oh man, I'm going to say Tyler O'Neill has got to be top five at this point. Tyler O'Neill is number three on the list. Number three. Yeah, that so is crazy. Got, yeah, you've got number one and you've got number three. This is really going to make me feel like a, a, we're rooting for laundry type thing here. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, Tyler O'Neill is number three. So Tommy Edmonds got to be up there, too. I'm going to say Tommy Edmonds. He's been around for a minute. Tommy Edmonds is not on the list. Wow. Yeah. Really? Okay. So Dylan Carlson. Uh, I, I should I should make a uh, I should make a clarifier. What I have in front of me is my yeah. team debut date. Team debut. Yeah. Okay. Team debut. Oh, okay. I don't so think that, that is- really changes. I don't think that fully changes the way like any of us would think about it. But it yeah. is a, a small. It is a small clarifier. Yeah. Um, now, uh, well, no, DC came out in 2020, so that's only. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, so I'll retract that. I'll. S- Let's say Giovanni Gallegos. He's been around for a minute. Yeah, good call. That's one of the harder ones. He's number five. Wow. Giovanni Gallegos. Holy cow. This team. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you've got number two and number four left. Yeah. I, that, I'm curious. I think I'm right. I just don't know if you're going to count it because I'm not sure if he's even on the major league roster right now. But I'm going to say Dakota Hudson. Dakota Hudson, number four. Number four. Okay, so, so I'm just missing number two. You're just missing number two. Oh God. Okay. I was, well, I won't give you any hints. You've you've okay. been doing well. So I kind of want to say Paul Goldschmidt. He came around around that same time. It's not Jordan Walker. I feel good about that. That's it. I already said one. Tyler O'Neill. I'm it's yeah. not DC. It's not Newt. It's not Taylor Motter. It's not Brendan Donovan. <laughs> uh, oh, shit. Is it Andrew Kisner? Andrew Kisner is not on my list. Yet. Oh, damn it. Okay. I know. Is that my I third strike? A... That was your second strike. Second strike. Okay. Um. All right. I feel like I've thought about everybody on the team. who I'm missing somebody in the bullpen, maybe. Um. Oh, no, he's gone. Genesis is gone. Uh, crap. <laughs> Who's on this team anymore? Um, Jake Woodford, would he count? No, he hasn't been around long enough. Uh, oh, man, I'm really blanking here. I, yeah, I guess I'm going to have to say before I give up, uh, I'll say Paul Goldschmidt. No, Ben, I'm, it's Miles oh, my, Michaelis. Miles, no. <laughs> I, he didn't even, I don't know why. He I know, didn't you didn't in even, my brain. You didn't even say his name. That's why. He's our I, number I, one. Yeah, I, I felt wow. like I could have given you a hint there, but um, you were yeah. doing well. So, so yeah, Miles. So the Damn. list in order is Adam Wainwright, Miles Michaelis, Tyler O'Neill, Dakota Hudson, Giovanni Gallegos. The five wow. most tenured Cardinals by start date. And yeah. Yeah, it's pretty funny. So, huh. all right. Well, I think you did well. All things you you got four yeah. of five. I'll uh, take that. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, we're just rooting for laundry. <laughs> <laughs> it really feels like that. <sighs> uh, all right. Well, thank you everyone for listening. And if this episode's been a little choppy, um, you know, thanks for your patience. The the uh, Florida just doesn't have good internet apparently. No, um, that makes sense. At, yeah and so uh we'll be back next week same time uh we still have a lot of baseball to watch should still have some fun this season so thank you all for being with us again consider the patreon patreon.com slash talking about birds uh hopefully we have some fun games regardless of the outcome over the next yeah. week we'll be back next week to talk about them and until then go cards let's go jays let's go o's mm-hmm.